Hello there. Thanks for joining and welcome to another CycleStorm video. Uh, before jumping into the league, I figured I would give a little bit of thoughts and perspective on this current list that I'm trying out still. Uh, but now I'm, I don't know, half a dozen leagues in with this gaze. I've made some subtle tweaks to that over the time, and I just want to you know, go over the good and the bad of it uh, relative to a more stock list historically, as well as doing a quick overview of where I see, uh, w how I think about my, my sideboard here. Um, the first starting point is, is of course, gaze um, and what it's replacing, what it's better at relative to the, you know, the, the previous iterations, what it's worse at. I would say that what I think, and it's relatively small sample size at this point, what I think right now is that it is uh, slightly more consistent at um, at turn fours and turn threes than the previous list, um, just has kind of increased that consistency. I'm not 100% sure that I can attribute all of that to gaze though, and we'll get back to that in a second when we talk about the mana base, but I believe it's partly related to gaze. So I think that what gaze does is it allows us to cut a lot of the fluff, like the second ploy, like the mystical teachings. Uh, actually, I should back up one second. What are, what's different from the initial draft that Bryant proposed with gaze? Um, Basically, the only changes that I've made are uh, adding another cycler in place of the teachings. Uh, I just felt like with the digging power of gaze, we don't really need the teachings um, just because we can turbo through our deck so much faster. Uh, then the other change that I made was shifting one island to a swamp because I felt like it was slightly too blue dominant uh, in the way that it was originally constructed, at least for my take, for my liking ran into some situations where I was in a position to, to combo, but just didn't have a single starting black mana. And that was kind of frustrating. And I think that it really should be a little bit, a little bit. We are a, a black deck more than a blue deck, in my opinion. So I'll leave that there. Uh, the only other thing that I changed is I'm using a subtly different fetch than he was using, uh, just because the other one screams combo, in my view, where this one could be in a handful of other control decks. Obviously, relatively minor equity there, but it could make somebody um, flub a mulligan. Uh, sorry, not a mulligan, uh, a cantrip decision on turn one. Uh, and that, that could really matter uh, if they think we're on fams or something like that, for example, uh, in the dark. So um, not that that's a terribly hard matchup, but you, you see the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, Faye would probably be a better example of, of something that could uh, you could conceivably uh, you know, have them stack a preordine differently than they would have otherwise in light of that um, that land. So let's talk about gaze. Let's talk about the mana base. So I was a, a pretty big skeptic around this land in particular, and and I still would be if we were talking about the. Um, sorry, my dog is is messing around in the background. She's just a little bored. Um, I still would be in an old list. But because we have both black and blue requirements early, and because um, what, what this land allows in that, in that environment is it, it allows us to keep a lot more opening hands or six card hands than we would if we were running a Baron's mana base in the, with the desire for both blue and black mana early. Um, it has one downside, in my opinion, which I think I potentially overrated when I was initially thinking about this, which is that on a turn where you're potentially going to combo, if this is the only land you have in hand, you obviously can't play it, where if it was a Baron's, you could theoretically play it out on that turn, and you can actually gain a sizable amount of mana. It could be two or three mana off that playing that, that Baron's out, because uh, it might mean um, your, your, uh, songs, maybe times two might be, uh, you know, maybe three mana is a, is a stretch, but like in that early stage when you're starting to combo, 
every man accounts and so that that is the downside of running this land is you're you're losing that opportunity what i have found though is that i just have altered my play patterns on that turn a little bit so i might be a mana short of where i might have been otherwise if i had played out a, a barons but i just start to combo and then assume that i'll draw basic and play the basic later on after that initial reaping has resolved or possibly even after the second reaping is resolved and at that point usually i'm just looking for islands you know uh, because i want to have more more blue mana and so i've i've gotten started i might be one or two mana short of what i would have been otherwise if i were able to play out of barons but all that in the balance the fact that it allows us to keep more opening hands i think outweighs that that downside um gaze so the way i see it gaze is an improvement over the the alternatives what we've been running previously uh, because they basically take the slot of you know some number of cabal some maybe another ploy and maybe a teachings or two maybe maybe a cycler depending on how you how you how you build these things um what it what it does is it just really allows you to kind of accelerate through um through your deck in a way that just cycling one by one you can't do uh that's that's obviously apparent what's less apparent though it is a spell that can be interacted with and one of the core strengths of our deck is that our draw engine cannot be inter interacted with on the stack basically at all um and there is there is something really nice about that um, but of course in interactive matchups, what it really does is it gives us four, four cuttable cards that keep the core of our deck intact and allow us to bring in interactive spells. Um, so that, that's some upside, some downside, uh, but I think, you know, better, better than the alternatives at the moment. Um, the one other thing that I would add about it is that I believe it is a further skill testing element to an already very skill testing deck. Um, so it really it really taxes your um, your ability to optimize early game decisions, how you want to prioritize using your mana, what you want to fetch for, even on a greater degree than the old lists. In my opinion, one of the strengths of those old lists is you could be very linear in the way in which you, the sequence in which you cycled creatures, the sequence in which you fetched colors. Um, you could be a lot more formulaic and have a lot of success with that, where with this, you have a tension between blue and black mana. You have a tension between trying to get the gaze early, but then also you don't want to instead cycle into a horror that you could no longer cast, or sorry, cycle, for instance. So... I think it it adds an element of push and pull to your decision making in the early game, um, but it it has a, a a reward to that, a reward to correctly using it in your upkeep in a way that draws you into the card. I mean, it's kind of like a, a brainstorm in a sense for us with, with upside in that case, and uh, we really don't ha didn't have a selection like that before. So that was enough talk about that. Um, let's go into talking a little bit about the board, uh, here down to the scav, I like that part of the board. Um, I like the dispels and the vision charm versus blue decks that might, uh, have, uh, have relics. Uh, I like the dispels specifically because they both can, um, protect our, our scobs, protect our mana. Um, and even counter a, a strands if if that's what makes sense. The vision charms have been just just amazing. Um, all three modes have their uses, and it means that you're not going to have um, artifact destruction clunking up your hand. You're not going to have to splash for another color. Um, it just it, it's just all upside with this card. Um, there has been some discussion of boarding three. I, I really think that um, that overboarding is a really big problem with this deck. So I, I really don't like to don't want to swap more than about five cards. Um, and, and really, I'd rather it be a lower number than that. So I'm I'm on three dispel to vision charm. And I like having the second scob both for beating strands and for um, racing type matchups where they can't interact with it like 
boggles, like uh, elves, um, that that type of thing. Um, just to, to name a couple. Um, the, then as we go into this section of the board, this is where I'm just not, I'm honestly not super happy with it. Um, but I, I just feel like we have uh, a you know a lot more space than we really need. Um, and so we're playing some cards that I, I don't love here. Um, start with a, a potentially controversial one. I think Flaring Pain is actively bad. The only reason I'm running it is for a game three versus Cogate scenario where I'm really low on clock. Um, but other than that, I would rather have a Dispel or a Scob in that slot, or honestly just a creature or like any number of, of more integral cards. I just think it's it's not the right card to be playing. Second ploy, I'm kind of off it. Uh, I think versus red, I'm I'm basically not not interested in it. I think I just want to um, bring in two vision charms and race. Um, darkness is medium, I would say, um, possibly better than the alternative, particularly if you're boarding out a non non cycler for it in a racing matchup. But I I honestly don't love it. Um, and Necromass is another card that um, that I don't love because I think it has a very narrow utility. I think it's basically only uh, good against blue black and blue red fey, and and I've had a little bit of success with it versus Terror as well, um, primarily as a game two strategy uh, to kind of juke them and then go back to full combo in game three. Um, you know, basically trading off. Sometimes it just wins. Um, if it doesn't just win, you can kind of trade off uh, with the first trade off the first batch with their creatures, and then use reaping as a way of playing three five fives instead of the typical combo, um, which which can be fine, can win games. Uh, but I think that it's kind of a cheese strategy and one that I I don't really think is that good versus them. And there's honestly not any other matchups that I really want to bring it in against. Um, a couple, like what other notable exceptions are there that are missing from the board? I think Fairy Macabre is a, is a good, uh, meta call, but in spite of Hamuda's epic performance with Mogwarts, it hasn't really taken off in the league so much. So, uh, I, I haven't been playing that. Um, I think that Duress is a very potent sideboard, sideboard spell that I can, I put in the same, um, kind of category as dispel shall we say but um as being able to both i i believe it's situationally better and situationally worse than dispel um it it has the advantage it has informational advantage which is invaluable but of course if you look at a handful of counter spells that they and you can just take you can only take one obviously the dispel would be better i think that dispel is better in this build because we're so blue centric with our mana to support the gaze it just means that dispel is easy for us to cast and we could reap those rewards of the being able to pinch them on mana with it in a way that duress doesn't but duress is a very good card and and i think i i but i consider it to be um you know d dispel or duress that's my perspective uh, another option, of course, is Pyro, which I think is is very solid versus Fey, um, but there just hasn't been much Fey lately, so I just haven't been uh, too interested in splashing over that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I wish there was other stuff that I that I liked more, uh, but but this is what we've got as of right now. Um, as far as our position in the meta, I think we're solidly tier two, uh, but with some glaring issues, you know, the, the red matchup is very, very, very challenging. Um, I, I would say even with very tight play on our end, um, when I'm like really playing well, I, my most typical outcome is a one, two. Um, usually I can get one, one game on them, but the problem is that they have a plan that is very fast and they have a haymaker versus us. We have no haymaker versus them. Um, our only potential, uh, our only potential, uh, way to beat them is to be faster than them. And they're more consistent at being fast than we are. Plus they have a haymaker. So it's, it's just really a rough situation. 
I think everything else is totally beatable. Um, and not that it's impossible to win a match against Red. You just have to run really hot and be really on point, and they have to have bad luck. And that's that's just a lot to ask for, um, particularly if you run into multiple Red decks in a league. Um, the other Tier 0 deck, uh, we definitely have game against. So, you know, we're, that's that's good. The, the issue is that, you know, so many types of mid-range decks in the format just run a lot of graveyard hate, and it's really punishing for us. Obviously, we have more resilience than we've had in the past, but it's still just, it's it's tough, you know. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I think that it's a really fun deck to play. I think that it's a deck that you can have good results in if you kind of dedicate yourself to learning the play patterns and delving into the details. But it's not your wins don't come easy, um, and and that's part of what makes it enjoyable and part of what, what makes it rewarding. But I don't think that you should go, have a false sense that this is a tier one or even a tier one point five deck, um, in spite of of the innovations we have been trying to to push here. Uh, so without further ado, uh, sorry I kind of rambled on for a long time, but hopefully that's interesting to someone. If somebody has some question on my logic on any of that, because I may have not been that eloquent or has some, you know, point they'd like to discuss, definitely feel free to reach out.